Welcome to another lecture of Psychology 101. This is your instructor, Dr. Shadi Bashai. And in today's lecture, we will discuss stress, coping, and health, which corresponds to chapter 12 of your textbook. So here we go. So we have all at one point or another felt stressed out. Stress is a very natural human response and it usually signals that you perceive something out there in the environment as sufficiently taxing on your coping resources. Stress is defined as the tension or discomfort or uh, physiological symptoms that arise when you think um, a stressor or a stress-inducing event or deadline, for example, is going to strain your ability to cope effectively. A traumatic event is a type of stressor in the environment that is so severe that it sometimes has a very negative and severe stress-related reaction in us. Sometimes the experience of these extreme traumatic stressors is associated with longer-term psychological or health consequences, and sometimes associated with the development of a condition called PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder. So a stressor is defined as anything outside. So an outside stimulus perceived as taxing to our coping resources, while coping is defined as what we do to deal with the stressors and their effects on our bodies. Stress, as, uh, as I mentioned in the previous slide, is a physiological tension, if you will, that appears when we think or perceive of a stressor as maxing out our coping abilities. So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say an, there's an upcoming exam for this course. Um, and that, so the upcoming exam would indeed be the stressor, while the tension that you feel every time you think about the exam is the stress. The level at which you feel the stress related to the upcoming exam also tells us uh, a, a little bit more about how much coping resources you think you have or how much coping resources you think you can deploy to manage the upcoming exam. So psychologists have studied the effects of stress on our mind and body and they've studied these effects through di three distinct approaches, if you will. In the first approach, stress is viewed as a stimulus. Second, stress as transaction. And finally, uh, the third approach is stress as response. So let's focus in on the first approach uh, to understanding stress and what that tells us in terms of the research conducted in that particular subfield. So stress as a stimulus approach tries to understand the perceived stressfulness of various stressors. So researchers using this approach will probably ask people, for example, to rate, uh, to rate how stressful a range of stressors are. And I have an example up here uh, in the slide. So the, the, the researchers in this uh, particular approach, that is uh, stress as stimulus, might tell us that stressor of, for example, waiting in line when you're in a hurry it will produce a little bit less stress than the, the stressor of failing an exam, for example, uh, which in turn might create less stress than stressors related to these severe uh, and trauma-based events, such as war, combat, and sexual assault. So the stress as a stimulus approach tries to understand what our reactions are to a range of different stressors and rates the stress-inducing nature of these stressors on a range based on people's perceptions and reactions to such, uh, such stressors. And this approach tells us uh, a lot. So we've, we, through research, through this particular approach, we've learned a lot about how people uh, rate different stressors. For example, 
the impact of some stressors declines with age, um, as just an example. So we know that uh, relationship breakups or dissolution is rated as a very highly uh, stressful event for people just starting out university. But the perceived stressfulness of a breakup becomes uh, perceived as less stressful as you get older. Okay? So the, the breakups are, are not as stressful as you get older. Uh, this approach also tells us that, uh, that events that we evaluate as positive from a social perspective for example, such as marriages, pregnancies, births, can actually produce a significant amount of stress for a lot of people. So even positive life events can be quite stressful. Finally, this approach to uh, understanding stress also tells us that people can sometimes find a silver lining in even the most disastrous or calamitous of, uh, of all events. But that is more likely if the event is occurring to entire communities or cities as opposed to uh, stressors that impact individuals. So it's more of collective uh, disasters, if you will, that you find this level of community cohesion as opposed to um, more personal uh, traumatic events, for example. So when, disaster, when disasters happen, such as natural disasters, sometimes people can actually band together and their social cohesion increases as a result of that. So there's some silver lining here. I want you to take a few seconds to ponder the following scenario. So how and why does the exact same event happening to two people produce such wildly different stress-related reactions? The answer to this question concerns researchers who are interested in understanding stress as a transaction. So this is the second approach here to understanding stress. Stress as a transaction uh, also tells us a lot about, about uh, how people perceive stress. So this approach tells us that stressors are sometimes in the eye of the beholder. Okay? That is, people interpret stressors and interpret their own ability to cope with the stressors. And that will mean the difference between feeling a lot of stress and maybe feeling a little bit of stress. So a researcher who's very prominent in uh, the field of stress as transaction uh, is by the name of Lazarus. And he talked about two important appraisal or interpretive processes that happen to determine how much stress a given person uh, will experience, for example, when they're faced with a stressor. So the first appraisal process is called primary appraisal. And basically, primary appraisal it relates to uh, how stressful or psychologically taxing you perceive a stressor to be. So the primary appraisal is related to the question or wants to answer the question, is this event, is this stressor threatening? Is it harmful? In the second appraisal stage, if you will, we make an appraisal or judgment about our own coping resources and whether we are well-equipped, for example, to deal with different stressors. So this is called the secondary appraisal, as I, as I just mentioned a few seconds ago. And in this appraisal stage, you are asking the question, or at least your brain is, sometimes it happens below the threshold of awareness. So the brain is asking the question, can I cope with whatever it is that's coming my way? So the answer to the first question, primary appraisal, and question two, which is secondary appraisal, according to Lazarus, or at least people who work in this particular approach to stress, stress is transaction, uh, will determine how much stress someone will experience. Finally, and uh, given how central perceived coping ability is, to this particular approach of, of, uh, of understanding stress, stress as transaction, there are different strategies um, that are available to people to cope with their stress. And some of these strategies are more effective than others, of course, as, as you can probably imagine. So the, there is a category of coping strategies we call problem-focused coping, 
which basically relates to trying to manage the stressor itself in some way, to make it a little bit less stressful, a bit, a bit more manageable. For example, if you're stressed out about a, an upcoming exam, uh, problem-focused coping would look like you preparing a plan of action to study for that exam. Okay? Emotion-focused coping is less about the stressor itself and more about trying to manage the emotions uh, or reactions that you have during this stressful time. So if you're feeling stressed about that same exam, for example, and, and you're using an emotion-focused uh, coping approach, um, you would be trying to engage in distraction, for example. You're trying to distract yourself from all the tension that you feel uh, so in your attempt to minimize that tension. Or to have a glass of wine, for example, to get, to get rid of the knots in your stomach. So problem-focused coping is about managing the stressor to make it less stressful. Emotion-focused coping is about managing the emotions that make them, uh, so that, to make the process more tolerable for yourself, for example. In the final approach to understanding stress, we examine psychological and physiological responses to the stress itself. This is the stress as response approach. Our assessment of uh, physiological and psychological reactions to stress can happen in the real world or we can examine it in a laboratory setting or a laboratory situation. There are, for example, uh, la uh, laboratory, pretty reliable actually, laboratory stress induction tests that can reliably raise people's stress levels uh, by getting them to, per to participate or engage in very difficult or demanding tasks. And I'll give an example of what that one of them looks like. For example, one of them asks people to uh, present in front of angry panels or an angry panel of judges. And afterwards, the, the, the tasks ask them to count backwards in sequences of 13 from 1,039. Um, so this is all happening in front of judging eyes. So it's it can be quite reliable in actually raising people's uh, stress levels. The approach uh, of stress as response is also concerned about measuring um, hormonal reactions to stress, such as examining uh, levels of um, corticosteroids, for example, which is the stress hormone in the body that gets your body ready for uh, fight, flight or freeze response, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about in the past. So we've developed many tools to help us uh, measure how stressed out people are. Turns out that counting the number of uh, major life events that have occurred over the past few years, turns out that that's an important predictor of physical and mental health over the next uh, little while. The scale that assesses how many major life events have occurred over the last year or so uh, we call the Social Readjustment Rating Scale, or SRRS. The scale works by assigning a score of how stressful 100 major events, uh, life events are, and, and that score is, is derived from expert opinion, basically. And it sums up the, your overall score based on how many times you've experienced these major life events. Um, and provides you an estimate based on that score of how likely it is for you to suffer physical or psych psychological problems in the next uh, in the next year or so. And let me show you what I mean here to make it just a little bit more concrete. So the scale rates the stressfulness, you know, of things like death of a spouse, divorce, getting a jail term, um, personal injury or illness. So the, it rates these as some of the most stressful of life events. What's interesting or what's striking about the, the SRRS or the Social Readjustment Rating Scale is the fact that even events that we deem positive, and this was mentioned a little, little bit ago, um, so events that we deem as, as positive, but uh, they're still considered major stressful life events. And these include things like marriage, pregnancy. Uh, so they make their way onto the list of the most stressful life events here. So it's not, it's not necessarily the case that all stressful life events are negative. There have been uh, multiple criticisms 
of the Social Readjustment Rating Scale, or SRRS. So even though it's in heavily used, uh, there have been a number of criticisms leveled against it. Uh, for one, the scale neglects to factor in uh, some things, factors such as coping resources, for example. And we talked about how important these are in the stress as transaction approach. So that is, as we learned from that approach, the stress as trans transaction, not everyone will be stressed out at the exact same level as everyone else uh, based on the same events. So the scale neglects that, but also neglects the negative health consequences of not major life events, but minor life events, what researchers are calling uh, low-grade or daily hassles, for example. So research tells us that these chronic daily hassles such as being stuck in traffic, you know, like waiting in line, having quor uh, quarrels with coworkers on a regular chronic basis. Uh, so the research is telling us that these daily hassles also have a very uh, sometimes negative impact um, in our life. So they actually have almost the same negative impact as major life events. Finally, the scale also fails to consider uh, the bi-directional nature of stress and health and mental health. We know, for example, that uh, being diagnosed with a physical health condition increases people's stress. So it's not necessarily the case that stress precedes negative health consequences. Sometimes health consequences can produce stress. We also know that uh, people with mental health difficulties, uh, for, for example, depression, they tend to avoid or withdraw from their environment which sometimes leads to higher stress because basically life is not being dealt with as effectively as, as could be during these very difficult times. So we, we call this particular brand of, of stress the stress generation hypothesis, meaning that sometimes having a, a, a mental health condition or a physical health condition uh, exacerbates the stress in some way. Okay? So it's a bidirectional two-way street, if you will. So now let's, uh, let's focus our attention a little bit on how stress impacts the human body. What, uh, perhaps um, one of the most cited and well-known figures in, in this field, which is trying to understand the impact of stress on the human body, is a Canadian researcher by the name of Hans Selye. And Hans Selye examined how stress impacts bodies of animals, and he basically applied the same principles over, uh, over humans. And what Selye found was that the body goes through several stages when faced with uh, prolonged stress or perceived stress. And he called the entire process of us trying to deal with the stress, our bodies trying to deal with the stress, the general adaptation syndrome. And he described uh, the general adaptation syndrome in terms of three distinct stages or processes. In the first stage, what, uh, when a threat, for example, is perceived to be taxing to our resources, the body starts ringing the alarm. So this stage is called the alarm reaction stage. So this is when the um, autonomic nervous system basically springs into action to, to simply put, to try and preserve your life. Remember, when, when you feel stress, when, you're, when your body's reacting to a, to a stressor, uh, it's reacting as if it's reacting to a predator um, out in the savanna desert, if you will. Okay? So, so brain regions are often in interpreting so are often uh, involved in interpreting, um, interpreting the threat and then mobilizing the body into action. So these brain circuits, for example, include uh, things like uh, the emotional circuit, so the amygdala, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus. Um, so these first interpret uh, the presence of a threat, then help the body secrete appropriate hormones such as adrenaline, to ready the body for this process called the fight, free, uh, flee, or freeze response, if you will. So that's the HBA axis, or the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, 
which is uh, responsible for the re release of the primary stress hormone, and that primary stress hormone is called cortisol. And that's basically the stress that helps mobilize all the other important hormones and, and other important organs uh, into action, if you will. So in the second stage of Hans Selye's general adaptation syndrome, your body becomes optimized to resist the stress. For this particular stage, um, it's called resistance, by the way, newer parts of our monkey brains start taking over. So these newer parts of our monkey brains, uh, they're the more, they're, they're the thinking parts. They're the more rational parts. So when you start to, so all the alarms are, are going off, um, eventually your body starts to uh, tap into its own coping resources to battle the stress. But problem is the fight unfortunately cannot last forever. So your body's mobilizing the newer parts of the brain to try and fight, resist the stress, right? To try to mobilize all the coping resources that you have, but you run out of steam, you run out of energy. So you get into the final stage of Hans Selye's uh, general adaptation syndrome, and he called the stage exhaustion. So the body starts to break down in this stage. So this happens when the body has been in a ready and battle mode, if you will, for a prolonged period of time. And this is the stage, uh, the stage at which you start seeing damage um, happen to the body, uh, to both our, our body and our psychology, actually, uh, including damage to our immune system, unfortunately. And here's a graphical depiction of the three stages of the general adaptation syndrome. So obviously, first, there's the alarm reaction. Your body's getting ready to fight this threat. And then your body starts resisting the threat, you know, incorporation of the coping resources, etc. And then you just cannot maintain it. You just, you know, it's too much on the body to maintain. So you just, exhaustion sets in. Just like no two people have the exact same stress reactions to even the same events. People who identify as women tend to have uh, slightly different reactions from uh, people who identify as men. And uh, it turns out that women are more likely to nurture and seek social support during times of heightened stress. So this process of nurturing and seeking so, uh, social support is what researchers are calling the tend and befriend process. And the tend and befriend process is uh, usually operates in conjuncture with the other uh, process that's going on, which is the, the, the fight, um, flight, or freeze response. As mentioned in the beginning of this lecture, there are unfortunately stressors out there that are so severe that they're capable of creating lasting psychological distress or psychological symptoms. We call such severe stressors uh, traumas. And traumas are usually accompanied by very intense emotional responses to the experience of stress. Uh, these emotional responses include things like feelings of fear, anger, horror, Traumatic stressors also uh, could be related to, sorry, traumatic stressors could be related to witnessing or being confronted with things like death, serious injury, or experiencing some kind of sexual violence. Uh, natural disasters, such as floods and earthquakes, can also be uh, classified as, as uh, traumas. So can accidents and, and instances of violence, for example. So, as mentioned, some people respond to these traumas by developing a condition called post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, which is this long-lasting stress reaction that is the result of experiencing some kind of a trauma. The lifetime prevalence rates are about 5% in, uh, in men and about 10% in women. And the likelihood of developing PTSD symptoms also actually depends on the type of trauma 
that people have, ex have experienced. And I'll show you what I mean here. So as you can see here, given that people may band together during things like natural disasters, um, and the fact that natural disasters just don't feel as personal as some of these other traumatic events, uh, the, the rates of PTSD after such uh, natural disasters is relatively low, 4 or 5%. The more personal the type of trauma experienced, the higher the likelihood people will develop PTSD symptoms. Okay? There is a very, very intricate relationship between the experience of stress and the body's uh, immune system. It goes without saying, of course, that immune system is our body's defense uh, system or mechanism against invading bacteria, viruses, and, and other uh, illness-inducing organisms. Okay. Uh, I, so I'm, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to challenge you to stop my video here and click on the link okay, by just either you can right click on it and uh, and go to the hyperlink or you can use in slideshow mode, full screen slideshow mode, you can just click on that link. Um, and uh, the link is a brief YouTube clip that showcases how complex and intelligent our immune system really is. And there are conditions known to disrupt or compromise immune functioning. Uh, and I'll give you an example of what that condition might be. One condition is AIDS, for example, that uh, is known to compromise immune functioning. So given that there is this strong relationship between stress and immune functioning, there is a whole subfield in psychology and medicine that's dedicated to the study of the relationship between the immune system and psychological uh, factors and, and the central nervous system generally. And in this field of psychology is called psychoneuroimmunology. Uh, the research from this field has uh, taught us a lot, of, a lot of things, actually, about how stress impacts our immune functioning. For example, there is now lots of evidence to suggest that People who experience a, gre a great deal of stress um, are more susceptible to catching a cold virus, for example. There's also evidence to suggest that people, uh, people who are undergoing a great deal of stress because they're caring for somebody who has an illness such as Alzheimer's, have a lower ability to heal from wounds or injuries, and have a lower ability for their blood to clot, actually. So it's you can see the, the dynamic interplay between the experience of subjective psychological stress and the body's immune functioning. There are a number of what is called stress-related illnesses, which are physical conditions with organic or physical causes, such as ulcers, uh, coronary heart disease, and AIDS, which the research is telling us are impacted by psychological or, or subjective feelings of stress. So stress actually can change uh, the outcomes in these conditions. For this reason, physicians are now beginning to acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the roles of psychology, social factors, etc., in determining physical illnesses, just as we describe, such as ulcers, uh, heart disease, and AIDS. So this field uh, takes a, what is called a biopsychosocial perspective on illnesses, which tries to understand disease and, and uh, origins of disease, as well as uh, treatments of different disorders or diseases through a biological, psychological, and social lens and the interaction of all these three uh, different factors. Let's take, for example, coronary heart disease. Heart disease is defined as complete or partial blockage of the arteries which provide oxygen to the heart. It is, uh, at least according to recent estimates, it is the number one cause of death actually worldwide, not just in the United States. And it turns out 
that uh, that stress and other psychological factors are very much associated, um, or at least they're significant contributors to coronary heart disease. We know, for example, that people with a particular personality or- orientation um, called type A personality at, uh, are at a particularly higher risk for developing coronary heart disease. Type A personality is, uh, is typified by feelings of anger, hostility, being very competitive, for example. Um, and we know that there are social factors that contribute to heart disease as well. So it's not just psychological. There are social factors that contribute to this condition. For example, people with uh, lower socioeconomic status, so lower on, in education and lower in uh, income, um, are at a heightened risk for developing co- uh, coronary heart disease. And it's, it's probably not even independent from the experience of stress. So people who find themselves lower on the socioeconomic ladder ha- tend to face a lot more hardship and stress in life, right? It's, it's, it's more difficult to afford, um, afford food now. It's more difficult to afford uh, healthy options. Until next time.